Hello, David Macmillan here. How to describe myself? Well, I'm still alive, despite the best efforts of probably five different uh, police agencies. But here I am. And today, introducing what could be a series of just general subjects. Now, this little film was put together really by James Esposito, who is really a craftsman behind uh, many of Sean Atwood's videos and some of his specials. And he uh, graciously um, decided to do a kind of a test run of subjects of any kind, not just true crime. But tonight will be on Maya Lansky, a kind of interesting American crook, known as the most successful American gangster. And I guess if you rate that in terms of the number of times arrested and reputed fortune, I guess he's quite high. Runs for about half an hour and gives the setting. Now, if you'd like something that uh, goes into some sort of a subject in a certain amount of depth, let me know. It could be on anything. It doesn't have to be true crime. And not necessarily my opinions. <laughs> uh, they're cheap. But you can get some background information and a little bit of research. Anyway, it's been a kind of busy week. Sean seems to be tangled up as we speak early in October 2020 in a, a mild bit of splashback from his... Uh, uh, attempts at humor in dealing with, um, well, people get the name wrong, but it's somebody called androgyny. Yeah, androgyny. It, androgynous means having the characteristics of both sexes. And the tired old drag queen behind uh, the videos, which are subject of trolls, well, it doesn't really have the characteristics of any sex. Quite sad. But I'm not really here to uh, slag somebody off. I've, I've got other other formats for that kind of thing. So here's my Lansky. And he's still a mystery. Let me know what you think. At the outset of the 20th century, poverty and repression across the world drove many people to make a new life in the United States of America. Ships would arrive at Ellis Island in New York City, where they would pass beneath the Statue of Liberty. Few would know the words carved beneath, written by American poet Emma Lazarus, whose family of Sephardic Jews fled persecution in Europe generations before. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. In 1911, a nine-year-old Jewish boy arrived from Poland to join his father in Manhattan's Lower East Side in New York City. He was Maya Lansky, who would one day become the most successful American gangsters of all time. America might have meant freedom for the immigrants, but it was no free ride. Those who stayed in New York were often limited to the ghettos that formed around those who had similar languages or spoke the same language. The Lower East Side of the city held immigrant districts including Scandinavians who left for America as did many Germans due to economic depression, political corruption and agricultural failure in their homelands. Many people in Norway and Denmark were religiously persecuted. The Chinese, driven by poverty, settled around Mott Street, Pell Street and Doyer Street. Many Irish had arrived two generations earlier following the Great Famine in Ireland that killed over a million people and forcing a million more to America. 
Italians from southern Italy came to escape poverty and exploitation by the criminal groups, later known as the Mafia. Unfortunately, many criminals shared the same ships, having failed to rise to the top in their home country. But the largest group from 14th Street to the Brooklyn Bridge, with half a million residents, by 1916 was comprised of Jewish immigrants. Why did they stay in New York, where they lived in squalid, cold water, dark, overcrowded apartment blocks? Because simply getting to America took most of their money. They couldn't afford to go farther inland. Traditionally, the street gangs that roamed Manhattan were homegrown Americans. Irish immigrants and one of the first American Italian mobsters, Paul Kelly, real name Paolo Antonio Vaccarelli, a boxer and brothel keeper. The gangs, colorfully known as the Forty Thieves, who operated in the Five Points neighborhood, the Bowery Boys, the Dead Rabbits, who were pickpockets, robbers, and included Hellcat Maggie, who wore brass-capped fingernails. Racketeering and prostitution were run by the legendary Five Points Gang itself, a mob that eventually fought it out with Paul Kelly, who had over a thousand hoodlums, and incorporated the early Jewish gangs. It was into this world that teenaged Maya Lansky found himself. After all, the streets were the only playground, and most kids admired the winners of the battleground. The organizer of the Jewish gangs was Monk Eastman, who had his own gang at the turn of the century, which became one of the most powerful street gangs in the city. Eastman was imprisoned, served in World War I, and was shot and killed in 1920 by a corrupt official in Lower Manhattan. It was time for the rise of the Jewish mobs, and the Italian Cosa Nostra, a phrase meaning simply, our thing. As a teenager, Maya Lansky met local kid Benjamin Siegel, later called Bug Siegel by the newspapers. Siegel was one of a gang on Lafayette Street who stole cars at a time when Lansky was profiting from a small gambling syndicate. Yet it was the coming of Prohibition the ban on sales of alcohol across the USA that transformed the economics of crime in America and turned small-time gangsters into multimillionaires. In January 1920, a constitutional amendment began operating under the Volstead Act, closing bars and liquor stores, with the manufacture, importation, sale and transport of alcohol now illegal it was unavoidable that gangsters stepped in to meet those services. Some of those who had operated bars opened speakeasies in cellars and converted premises. While crime across the country did not increase as much as people imagined, the profits did. Another friend of the teenage Maya Lansky was Italian-born Charles Lucky Luciano, who had attempted to extort protection money from Lansky. Lansky fought back and the two became lifelong friends. By 1919, Luciano had links to those who would become top mafia bosses, mafia leaders, including Vito Genovese and Frank Costello, a former member of the Five Points gang. That same year, lower Manhattan gang boss, Joe Masseria recruited Luciano as one of his gunmen. Around the same time, Luciano and his friends did much of the dirty work for famed gambler Arnold Rothstein, who had visions of turning organized crime, especially in gambling, into big business. Rothstein was born to a wealthy Jewish family, yet was addicted to the thrill of gambling. He would be killed for refusing to pay a gambling debt in 1929. Although well-educated, he was a risk-taker of the kind that Maya Lansky was not. Under these influences and with a natural intelligence and their perfect connections throughout the underworld, Maya Lansky became the ideal broker and money launderer for the mob. As well, while most high-ranking organized crime figures have spent long periods in prison, Lansky was never convicted of any crime other than a minor illegal gambling charge. 
In a meeting in May 1929 in Atlantic City with Luciano, Johnny Torrio, Lansky and Frank Costello, a plan was made to form a national crime syndicate in which the Italian, Jewish and Irish gangs could group their resources and turn organized crime into a national syndicate. This was the organizational skill that Mai Lansky brought to the American Mafia, and the National Syndicate lasted until the 1970s and beyond. Lansky was never tied down to one area, and so become involved in local turf duels. The bootlegging trade had taken him north to Canada, across whose border legal Canadian spirits were smuggled, and south to Florida, where he worked with Italian Vincent Jimmy Blue Eyes Allo, who was involved in setting up a casino in the town of Hallandale Beach, Florida. It is thought that in Francis Coppola's 1975 film The Godfather Part II, Lansky was the foundation for Hyman Roth. The character called Hyman Roth Sicilian Messenger Boy was modeled on Vincent Allo. Yet they were little alike in style. Fans of Jimmy Blue Eyes termed him the last of the gentleman gangsters. During the rise of American Nazism in the 1930s, and when Israel was being founded between 1945 and 1948, Lansky claims to have broken up an American Nazi rally. Such anti-Jewish rallies had become common enough. For months, Lansky's workmen effectively broke up one Nazi rally after another. As writer Rockaway notes, Nazi arms, legs and ribs were broken and skulls were cracked, but no one died. Lansky and over a dozen of his men wanted to prove that in America, the Jews would not take to becoming victims. During World War II, Lansky was reported to have aided the Office of Naval Intelligence's Operation Underworld, in which the government recruited criminals to watch out for German infiltrators and submarine-born saboteurs. Lansky helped arrange a deal that would secure the release of Luciano from prison. In exchange, the Mafia would provide security for the warships that were being built along the docks in New York Harbor. So, Lansky used this wartime opportunity to help his longtime friend and associate Lucky Luciano. On June 7, 1936, Luciano had been convicted on 62 counts of compulsory prostitution. That month, he was sentenced to 30 to 50 years in state prison. By 1938, Luciano stepped down as Genovese family boss and Frank Costello formally replaced him. Despite his tough reputation as a youngster and early ruthless violence, Lansky knew that when it came to running an illegal business, it was the business that mattered and using violence and threats against established American authorities was a dangerous substitute for brains, bribery and cooperation. Lansky's gambling casinos in Florida and New Orleans ran unhindered until after World War II, when Lansky saw that moving to a nearby and compliant foreign country was the only way to hold off arrest by the ever-increasing power of the FBI, America's national crime agency. Lansky's casinos always paid on winnings. He had seen enough unprofitable violence to know that small-time cheating is never profitable in the casino business. Meanwhile, Lansky's friend Ben Siegel was creating organized crimes control of gambling in Nevada on the West Coast. In 1946, Lansky convinced his New York Mafia connections to place Siegel in charge of Las Vegas and became a major investor in Siegel's Flamingo Hotel. Siegel began a spending spree. He demanded the finest building that money could buy at a time of post-war shortages. As costs soared, his checks began bouncing. By October 1946, the costs were above 
$4 million. By 1947, the flamingo's cost was over $6 million. That's equivalent to $60 million today. The Flamingo opened on December 26, 1946, at which time only the casino, lounge, theater, and restaurant were finished. Although locals attended the opening, few celebrities materialized. A handful drove in from Los Angeles despite the bad weather. Lansky attended a secret meeting in Havana in 1946 to discuss Siegel's management of the Flamingo Hotel. Siegel was given a reprieve, and more time and money. But his fortunes did not improve. On the night of June 20, 1947, as Siegel sat with his associate, Alan Smiley, in Virginia Hills, Beverly Hills home, reading the Los Angeles Times, an unknown assailant fired at him through the window with a 30 caliber military M1 carbine hitting him many times, including twice in the head. No one was charged with killing Siegel, and the crime remains officially unsolved. 20 minutes after the Siegel hit, Lansky's associates, including Gus Greenbaum and Mo Sedway, walked into the Flamingo and took control of the hotel. According to the FBI, Lansky retained a substantial financial interest in the Flamingo for the next 20 years. Lansky said in several interviews later in his life that if it had been up to him, Ben Siegel would be alive today. Siegel's death marked a power transfer in Vegas from New York's five families to the Chicago Mafia. Lansky stepped back from Vegas operations, but is believed to have both advised and aided Chicago boss Tony Accardo in initially establishing his hold. After World War II, Luciano was paroled from prison on the condition that he permanently return to Sicily. However, Luciano secretly moved to Cuba, where he worked to resume control over mafia operations. Luciano also ran a number of casinos in Cuba with the sanction of Cuba's dictator, Fulgenico Batista, though the US government eventually succeeded in pressuring Batista to deport Luciano. Batista and Lansky had formed a close friendship and business relationship that lasted for a decade. At the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York in the late 1940s, it was agreed that Batista would offer Lansky and the Mafia control of Havana's racetracks and casinos. Batista would open Havana to large-scale gambling, and his government would match dollar for dollar any hotel investment over $1 million, which would include a casino license. Lansky would place himself at the center of Cuba's gambling operations. He immediately called on his associates to hold a summit in Havana. The Havana Conference was held on December 22nd, 1946, at the Hotel Nacional. This was the first full-scale meeting of American underworld leaders since the Chicago meeting in 1932. Those attending included such figures as Joe Adonis, Albert the Mad Hatter Anastasia, Frank Costello, Joseph Joe Bananas Banano, Vito Genovese, Mo Dalitz, Thomas Lucchese from New York, Santo Traficante Jr. from Tampa, Carlos Marcello from New Orleans, and Stefano Magadino, Bonanno's cousin from Buffalo. From Chicago, there were Accardo and the Fischetti brothers, Trigger Happy Charlie and Rocco, and representing the Jewish interest, Lansky, Dalitz, and Dandy Phil Castell from Florida. The names alone have become American Mafia poetry. The first to arrive was Luciano, who had been deported to Italy and had to travel to Havana with a false passport. Lansky shared with them his vision of a new Havana, profitable for those willing to invest the right sum of money. According to Luciano himself, he was appointed as CEO for the mob, to rule from Cuba until he could find a way back to the U.S. legally. 
In 1952, Lansky offered then-President Carlos Prio Sacaras a bribe of US $250,000 to step down so Batista could return to power. Once again, Batista took control of the government in a military coup in March 1952. He quickly put gambling back on track. Batista offered Lansky an annual salary of $25,000 to serve as an unofficial gambling minister. By 1955, Batista had changed the gambling laws once again, granting a gaming license to anyone who invested $1 million in a hotel or $200,000 in a new nightclub. Unlike the procedure for acquiring gaming licenses in Las Vegas, this provision exempted venture capitalists from background checks. As long as they made the required investment, they were provided with public matching funds for construction, a 10-year tax exemption and duty-free importation of equipment and furnishings. The government would get $250,000 for the license, plus a percentage of the profits from each casino. The casino business in Cuba ran smoothly for Mylansky for seven years, as did his interests in the Miami casinos. This must have been a golden period for a man in his 50s, protected by his friends at the highest level in Cuban government and by corrupt officials in Florida. In the first year of operations at his 440-room, $18 million Habana Riviera, profits ran to over $3 million. In 1959, everything changed, not just for Mylansky, but for all of Cuba. On New Year's Eve of 1958, while Batista was preparing to fly to the Dominican Republic and then on to Spain, where he died in exile in 1973, many of the casinos, including several of Lansky's, were looted and destroyed. The 1959 Cuban Revolution had begun. On January 8, 1959, Castro marched into Havana and took over, setting up headquarters in the Hilton Hotel. Lansky had left the day before for the Bahamas. In October 1960, Castro nationalized the island's hotel casinos and outlawed gambling. This action essentially wiped out Lansky's asset base and revenue streams. He lost an estimated $7 million. With the additional crackdown on casinos in Miami, Lansky was compelled to depend on his Las Vegas revenues. Both Lansky and other mafia figures always held the hope that Cuba would one day again be theirs. Santo Traficante Jr. would later admit to a congressional committee that he'd recruited other mobsters to assassinate Castro in the 1960s. Despite the CIA's backing in the Bay of Pigs invasion by US expat Cubans, Fidel would stay in power until his death in 2016. As for Meyer Lansky, the former arch manipulator returned to the United States where, despite long investigations, the only charges that were pursued were those of tax evasion. In 1970, Lansky fled to Israel. Although the Israeli law of return allows any Jew to settle in the state of Israel, the law allows government to use discretion to exclude those with a criminal past. Two years after Lansky fled to Israel, Israeli authorities deported him back to the US. The US government brought Lansky to trial with the testimony of loan shark Vincent Fatvini Teresa. Lansky was acquitted in 1974. Lansky's last years were spent quietly at his home in Miami Beach. He died of lung cancer on the January 15th, 1983, aged 80, leaving behind a widow and three children. His wealth amounted to just over $50,000. Talk persisted of secret accounts with hundreds of millions, but no one has found any proof. 
Despite nearly 50 years as a member of participant in organized crime, Lansky was never found guilty of anything more serious than illegal gambling. He has a legacy of being one of the most financially successful gangsters in American history. Some still dispute that, saying, where's the money? Why was he claiming to be poor in the 70s and the 80s? Yet, isn't that the definition of success in the organized crime world? To keep out of prison and leave people guessing? By that standard, Maya Lansky was a kingpin. Did he have a fortune? My guess is probably not. I think his only really true statement was, I crept out. I just don't think he would have been uh, running around scaring up money for, what was it, uh, son's medical problems? No, he wouldn't have, well, hopefully he wouldn't have been doing that at the end. Now, as I said, these half hour slots can be for any kind of subject. Where some kind of research is required, or perhaps, <laughs> as much as you can trust me on anything, trustworthy background information. It might even be technical. I kind of like those ones because it's like trusting a, a favored dog. You can trust the technical world because it can be tested against independent things, not just our human vanities. Anyway. Hope it held your attention. Oh, by the way, I'll be back uh, this week with part two of uh, So You Decided to Smuggle Some Cocaine from South America series. Uh, people have had an interest in that, and I guess with some reason, you always wonder whether you can do it, even if you never will. But it's a minefield, and I should know. I've made two characters for that. Jed Pontiac, an American, and Kevin Block, an uh, Englishman out in Cambridge. They seem to be tailor-made for the part of newcomers to the smuggling world. I promise I'll have part two of that up this week. Anyway, back soon. Bye.